Welcome, Toastmasters and honored guests. We are pleased to have you here at the World Championship of Public Speaking Showcase, and I am honored to introduce our international president-elect, distinguished Toastmaster, Richard E. Peck. Thank you, Jesse. Welcome to the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking Showcase. Congratulations to all three contestants who share this global virtual stage as first, second, and third place winners of the World Championship of Public Speaking. Members and guests, meet the 2020 World Championship winners. World Champion, Mike Carr. Second place winner, Linda Marie Miller. Third place winner, Lindy McLean. Congratulations to each of you. During today's showcase, we are going to speak with each winner for a few minutes, but first I invite our new world champion, Mike Carr, to enjoy two minutes to share acknowledgements with the audience. Mike. Oh, thank you very much. And I just wanna say some thank yous. First to Mark Brown, you are such a great mentor and you teased out the, the, some of the gold in, especially my semi, semifinal speech. Uh, thank you so much for all the work you, that you put in. I wanna thank my family, who is a great source of material and laughter and, and, and humility. They're, they have been so beneficial, and thank you to my wife, Julie, who told me I should use this speech and not the one I was thinking about. I want to thank also Don Reynolds, who stood on this stage decades ago and was my, gave me the most important evaluation at Speakeasy Toastmasters in Tulsa, Oklahoma, years ago, when he told me, no one wants to hear what you have to say until you crack your chest open and really expose who you are. And that changed my speaking forever. And then maybe most of all, I want to thank you because the purpose of this speech was I believe from my experience and talking with so many of you that there's a certain population of those of you watching that have magic stuck in around your ribs and you're afraid to let that out into the world because you're afraid the results just won't appear. And I hope, I, I thank you for the making the tries that you have and I thank you for the try that you will make in the next year just for the benefit of trying because the world needs your magic. Join the contest, start that business, take that leadership role and thank you for the good you're putting into the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mike, for your gracious and inspiring words. You have thanked a lot of people along your personal journey who have influenced your success up to this very moment. These acknowledgements are indicators of a true Toastmasters leader. Congratulations again. Later in the showcase, we will ask the winners some of your questions. If you would like to submit a question, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Type in your question, including the name of the contestant you would like to ask of, and then hit send. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. But first, knowing that our contestants love table topics, I'd like to ask some questions of them. I'd like to ask Mike, what does it feel like to be the 2020 world champion of public speaking? It is surreal. My daughter asked me that right after we heard the announcement and it is surreal. I've done Toastmasters for a long time, 23 years through several moves and have admired and learned from so many of the people that that get this title. So I, it is, it is surreal. It's a lot of fun. It, it is enjoyable. My children look at me like, really? <laughs> so it's, it's been fun, surreal, exhilarating. There's some relief that it's over. It's been at least a half marathon, if not a full marathon. 
Very good. Thank you, Mike. Just a follow up, and you mentioned it uh, the, the attention you're receiving. I'm sure your family is going to treat you differently when you get back home. But how does it feel with having this immediate onrush of attention as being a world champion? I'd say maybe that's, maybe that's the most surreal. And I know that, that really any of those speeches in that final could have won. So it is, I know that I end up getting that title, but I was, I was fortunate to be among a, a large group of people. It, it does feel a bit like drinking from a water hose. So any of you, if you don't hear from me quickly, please have patience. <laughs> it's a little bit, little drinking from the, from the, the, the water hose, but it's, it's, it's also fun. So thanks for asking. Excellent. Congratulations. Linda Marie, this question is for you. How does it feel to be the second place winner of the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking? Well, I'll mimic what Mike said. It's, it is absolutely surreal. I just can't even comprehend that I'm sitting in this seat and talking with you today. Having just joined Toastmasters a little less than two years ago, invited to my first meeting by Tony, who I spoke about in my final speech, it almost feels divinely inspired. It feels like it happened because of that. And I am honored, and it is such a privilege to be able to connect with the world on a message that's in your heart. So I think that's, that's really what it feels like, an absolute honor and a privilege. Thank you for that. And your subject matter was one of those edgy speeches that we like to see. It, what was it that you wanted people to walk away from after hearing that speech? I wanted people to walk away from it uh, with one of two thoughts in their heart. One was, oh my gosh, that sounds like me. That kind of resonates with me just a little bit. And I've gotten over a thousand emails so far just since the speech contest with people saying things like that. The second one was that I honor your authentic, your authenticity and your vulnerability to share that. And I would love you to be an ally with me, which is really what is really an honor and a privilege is to elevate the voices of people that have not had voices uh, in the world so far. Thank you. Lindy, this question is for you. How does it feel to be here on this great big virtual platform as a third place winner of the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking? Ah, yes, in the lower left corner, unmute myself. May I just say bonjour, Monsieur Peck, in honor of the fact that we might have been in Paris and are not. It is a tremendous honor to be standing in my own home and yet at the same time be have won third place in the world championship. I am moved and excited and honored to be with Honored to be with all the competitors in the finals and the semifinals. I just loved that I got to watch everything and all of them and, and took so much away in my heart from each, each of the participants. So it's a great joy to be here. Excellent. Just a quick follow-up question for you. What inspired you to write and speak about what has now become your winning speech entitled Your Buried Story? I hope that's fairly obvious to people who, who saw it. I, I have been on such an amazing journey this last year to have actually found my Peruvian family um, who I had not been in touch with for 40 years. It's been such an emotionally uh, fulfilling, overwhelming, humbling experience. And they have taken me in as if not a day had passed. I just feel graced. And I wanted to 
let Toastmasters everywhere know that things that you do not imagine are possible could happen simply because you have had the courage to tell your story and not just once, but again and again, so that it fills you to the point where something changes perhaps in you, perhaps outside, but there will be a change of some kind. So open your hearts and speak. Well, congratulations on reconnecting with your Peruvian family. Thank you. Here's a question we want to ask all three of you. It's actually a two-parter. So how did you modify your speech for A, your virtual audience, and B, your international audience? So Mike, we'll start with you. Sorry, something popped up. Oh, there we go. How, how did I change it for the virtual audience? I had a different speech for the final. I had that I had in mind if I were if I got to the final. It was a speech about my daughter, and I hope to give it someday because I love that speech. But as we got closer to the final and it was obvious that everything was going to be virtual, there's something I really love this virtual medium. There are things, there are advantages it has over live. Now there are uh, I'm excited to get back to live events. And when we get there, we'll love that. There are advantages live has over this, but there are certain things that you can do. So like this looks, this can look like a sliding door or if I'm climbing up out of a hole, do, playing with that medium, it, it, it opened up opportunities that could not happen on a live stage. And so modified that, really sat and thought, what could be interesting, what could add humor, and ended up rewriting a new speech based on uh, a chapter of just some writing I'd done and may someday be a chapter of a book. So that's how I changed for the virtual. For the international, then I remember, I, I added in the story about Norway because I remember as the boy, I don't know why <laughs> I was so fascinated getting away to Norway uh, to, to avoid that trouble, but I, I, I made sure I put that in because there are individuals around the world who are watching. And, and so I would say that's how I changed. And also some of the, the idioms, idioms that I did not add because they might be centric to Texas or the United States. I wanted, I wanted language that would, would translate more broadly to a global audience. Very good, thank you. And Linda Marie, how did you modify your speech for a virtual audience and for your international audience? For the virtual audience, I didn't really have to modify much because I have not been on the world stage at the convention before. So I don't have that experience of how big that stage is. I have spoken publicly a number of times, but I didn't have that kind of to deal with. And in my job, I'm online all day long. So I live in this square. And for me, being about making a difference for people, having people get that they matter, whether it's at work or whether I'm communicating with friends online via Zoom, I've had some good experience in being able to connect, create connection uh, virtually. One thing that I know is different, having been on a stage before, is on a stage you are looking and you're scanning your audience and you can look down at your notes and not look like you're being distracted. In the virtual world, you're three feet away from every human being you're talking to and you're looking into their eyes. And if you look over here, you're immediately not connecting with them. So that takes some practice in doing this. For the international aspect, uh, I like Mike, there was another speech that when I won at semifinals, I thought, wow, should I go ahead, should I give this speech? I'm not at the finals, should I give this speech? And I remembered something I saw recently online that Aaron Beverly said, and he said something to the effect of, we get to start risking and talking about controversial subjects in Toastmasters. And when I read that, when I heard that, I said, this is the speech that I'm going to give. I sought a lot of feedback from people that had experience internationally, which I did not have. 
people that had experience in gestures internationally, which ones would be appropriate and which ones would not, people who had experience in languaging and what words would not be carried across the world. So I, I just did a lot of research in that regard to prepare this speech and then eventually ended up deciding to do it. Thank you. Lindy, it's your turn now. How did you modify your speech for your virtual audience and for your international audience? For the virtual audience, speaking to one's camera screen as if it's a person takes a lot of practice. And honestly, by the end, I had taped a tiny picture of somebody near my camera because there's an, some people, it is easy to have your eyes go blank when you're talking and then it's not really doing anything as opposed to being engaged and actually trying to persuade or reach someone. So that's part of what was part of my practice. Also the joy of likening this Zoom environment to being, you know, this is your movie career, you know, you get to be on film instead of stage. And the advantages of film are, are they're just different, right? You, you have the capacity for intimacy that just does not exist on stage. And the flip side of that is that the camera will always pick up authenticity. So a recited speech sounds recited more so on Zoom than on the stage. So therefore, working on not saying it the same all, all, all every time, working on being able to make it sound like it's the first time you're saying it, that was part of the, the business of practicing for virtual environment. As, do you want me to answer the second part of it? Yes. So uh, for international audience, the, my biggest struggle, it was already an international story, has been trying to get take enough out so that I don't have to hurry too much and not speak too fast. And I could still have done more slowing down indeed to tell the story. I think the story of feeling ashamed or sorry about something and not talking about it is just, that's a universal experience. So that wasn't something I was worried about so much, the subject matter. Excellent. Thank you all for your answers to that question. Here's another question for all three of you. How has Toastmasters helped you personally and professionally? And this time, Lindy, we'd like to start with you. How has Toastmasters helped you personally and professionally? Toastmasters has been a, an unexpected gift. I have, will this October, I will have been in Toastmasters for four years. I had wanted to be an actor from a very small child and then that dream kind of died somewhere in the, in the process. So actually being in Toastmasters has given the, the, the possibility of using the spotlight to, to, to express myself in a new, whole new way and learning how to do it with my own words. That's a new thing from say being in a play and learning your lines there's certainly a craft, right, for, for crafting a speech. That's, that's been an exciting journey. But the real reason I joined Toastmasters was to learn some leadership skills. I had a friend who was a Toastmasters in California, and she had the wisdom to notice my enormous frustration and to say that that was leadership potential. So she sent me to Toastmasters to turn it from potential <laughs> into actual skills. And that's, that's been a huge part of the journey that I've been on, learning to be a leader. And that what I appreciate about Toastmasters for that is that nobody dies when you goof up. So uh, lots of my learning has been through making mistakes and I, I feel like I have a global community that I would never have had without Toastmasters. That is to me the greatest gift. Excellent. I've made several mistakes and I've noticed the world has never stopped turning when I've done that. So thank you for that information. Linda Murray, this same question for you. How has Toastmasters helped you personally and professionally? How Toastmasters help, has helped me personally is I have enjoyed being a speaker. I'm a, and I've always been a powerful speaker. I have a voice that carries. I have a seriousness about it. And I get a point across. When I joined Toastmasters, I thought, oh, this is easy peasy. I'm going to be a superstar. And then I got my first evaluation. What about vocal variety? 
What about pacing? What about actually connecting with the audience instead of just being a powerful speaker who gives a powerfully memorized speech? So it has vastly changed how I am when I am presenting any material anywhere or doing a training or anything. Toastmasters has honed my skill. No ahs, no ums, slip ticks, all of that has significantly improved since I joined Toastmasters. Professionally, I am a Pathways fanatic. I have only been in Toastmasters not quite two years, so I wasn't around when the whole legacy system was around. So when I joined, it was all about Pathways. And I am so charged up about everyone where I work joining Toastmasters and getting on a Pathways because there is no better leadership development possibility for the money than Pathways in Toastmasters. So it has helped me professionally in that I'm always trying to get people enrolled in it so that they can sign up and develop their leadership skills on one of the 11 paths. And I just never stopped talking about it. And it's helped me. I've almost finished with my first pathway. Very good. Congratulations on that. Mike, same question for you. How has Toastmasters helped you personally and professionally? And up until an hour ago, you may have answered this question just a little bit differently. But how has it helped you personally and professionally? That's right. And this is maybe where I need, I may need a high sign that I'm going over time because there's so much personally I have found my tribe and I found my tribe. I, I was so blessed to be able to join a couple of clubs in Austin. I, I've, I've been a, a member of more than two clubs, but that, that went out for dinner afterwards and, and they hung around and talked and shared stories afterwards. And some of the people that I met through Toastmasters have become some of the most important people in my life. What they spoke into my life, the, the experiences that we shared, the, the things that we've laughed about, it, it truly, I've found my tribe. And that has been a, a life enriching experience that I can't describe in the next two hours. So I won't, I won't try. The, the second part would be the, the ability to constant improve. There have been times in my career where I've just plateaued or I flatlined and things weren't going. I didn't feel like I was growing, but I could always, I could come to Toastmasters and feel like, okay, I can, I can get a little better at this speech. I can try this. I can test that and get really good feedback. So it was always an area where I could grow personally in my life while having a lot of fun and learn from all these people that have different experiences and are trying a lot of, a lot of different things. And then finally, on the, on the personal front, I would say just helping me become a better communicator. I joined Toastmasters because I could talk a whole lot and would go off on tangents and forget what point I was beginning to make. And I'd say, ah, um, so, and never knew I was doing that until I started getting evaluations to clean some of that up. And so I can, there's a so. <laughs> so I can, I can make my point a little better and stay within time professionally. I'd say two things. In our club in Austin, in Austin Toastmasters, we say you want to fail here, not in front of the board of directors. Come here, fail. It's a safe environment. Fail here, not in front of the board. So you don't in front of the board of directors. And there have been so many times when I've tried something in Toastmasters that fell flat. I went and reworked it, and then it really, it really worked. That my semifinal speech was a great example of that. Secondly, I'll tell you a quick story. Right after I started Toastmasters, I started doing table topics and, and having the hard work of aligning a question down into quick bullet points. I went back into my office, the phone rang, I picked up the phone and my largest client was calling to fire me. And, and my, my business at that time was, it was running on fumes anyway. I immediately stood up, assumed the position, looked up, held the phone up, thought about the different points I wanted to make, did a table topic, and that client did not fire me that day. <laughs> so it, it has helped in both ways. It is, it's, it, as long as we always work to constantly improve, Toastmasters is a, great, is a great resource. I believe in the mission. Very good. We didn't need to pull the timer out. And by the way, we gave the grammarian the day off, so you didn't have to worry about your soap. 
There's still plenty of questions I'd like to ask, but I'd like to give the audience some opportunities to have their questions asked. So this one here will be for all three of you. How did you decide which speech to use for the semifinals and for the finals? So let's start with Linda Marie this time. Yeah, so that's a very good question because I was adamant about the speech I gave as a final speech to be heard around the world. So I was debating, should I give that speech as my semifinal speech? Then I know it's gonna be heard and risk it not being good enough to go to the finals. What should I do? And I just decided to trust myself and trust that the speech that had gotten me, that my speech about experience, the noun versus the verb, had gotten me through the quarterfinals and that it probably had one more, maybe squeaking a win out of it. So I decided to just go with that and then save my message for the world on a, to a stage where I thought there might be a larger group of people watching. I suspected maybe there were some people that might just wait until the final competition to watch. And I wanted the largest population of people in the world to see it. So that was what drove my decision on that. Very good. Lindy, let's go to you and the same question. How did you decide which speech to use for your semifinals and for your finals? My answer would actually be similar. I knew from the moment that I found, we found my family and got to go visit them and share time and, now we can text and they called me on my birthday and saying happy birthday. You can't imagine how moving these things are after uh, being out of touch for 40 years. So I knew that I wanted to tell the world, uh, the Toastmasters world particularly about, because uh, I honestly feel like Toastmasters has done this for me. Some people laugh and say you did it, but I really, I would not have happened without Toastmasters. So that is, So I knew clearly what that speech was. For me, the process of Developing a speech is not a logical thing. I feel when I write a speech, it's like being in a dark tunnel and I have to keep delivering it before light starts to come in about what it's about and, and what the major points are. So I work from the inside out instead of the outside in or something. So my semifinal speech started as a blob, you know, and, and it took all those times to get as good as it was by the time it reached regionals and semifinals. So I just needed more time with that one. And that's, that's how I decided I had enough confidence that, well, that's, that's how I decided. Very good. Mike, your turn. How did you decide which speech to use for your semifinals and for your finals? After a few years ago, I went to the semifinals and I did not place. And the great Toastmaster, Joe Grondon, guy came out of that semifinal and went on into the finals. And I thought, what do I want to do? I, I realized that I had put too much emotional, I was, I was dedicating too much emotional landscape to winning a trophy and decided I, I just want to start writing speeches I love that say something and maybe have some art to them. So I read a book that talked about a, a friend who had died when the author was in high school or college. And I thought, oh my goodness, that I had a similar experience. And she really brought a lot of richness to my life. There were some unique characteristics to her that she had a heart condition that, that had kept her skin blue a lot of the time and started playing with that idea of blue could mean so many different things. So this speech I gave to the club, that semifinal speech I gave to the club maybe two, three years ago, just as a, a piece of art that I hoped encouraged them, but I, it, it was a speech I just wanted to give. So I almost didn't enter the contest this year. I thought, oh, I really want to at least give that blue speech in a contest and see what happens. So that's, that's how that speech came about. I have a follow-up question to that speech, which you just touched on, but maybe you could expand a little bit, is where did the inspiration for your speech come from? The, the inspiration for that blue speech came from a book that, that I read. It was uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Bad Word. <laughs> and, and, that, and that, in there, he tells the story of, like I said, losing a friend. And I, I thought about my own experience in this 
in this last speech, I happen to be having a conversation with my wife, Julie, talking about sometimes you can, you can try something and the voices that come to you can color your experience for years to come. And the, a, harsh, a harsh voice can keep a creative person from ever trying or reaching out there again. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and that was the motivation. Very good, thank you for that. This question is for Lindsay and Linda Marie. We'll start with, it's Lindy, not Lindsay, Lindy. What motivates you to speak and where do you acquire your content? We'll start with Lindy. That's a hard one. What motivates me to speak? Well, I guess it's pretty obvious. I, in the, my semifinal speech, I talked about how the first time I saw people on stage, it just sparked something inside of me. And it's not very complicated. I grew up in a household with a European style tradition of better to be quiet than to speak. Don't, do not speak unless spoken to. And also, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything. So to actually find a place and, and learn where I, I have my five to seven minutes, no one's going to interrupt me. <laughs> and um, not just that, but, but that there is magic, especially when emotion and language come together, that is irreplicable. That's, that's just, that's what it is. Speaking is different from writing because of that, because you add the human voice and the human emotions to the equation and it just becomes very powerful. Now, where I get my, in, my ideas, is that the second half of it? Yes. Uh, early on, someone pointed out that in order, particularly for a contest speech, you need to be ready to, to deliver it a lot of times. So you need to be feel really passionate about it. So content from my speeches always comes from inside. And like I say, it sometimes comes out identif unidentifiable the first time. So it's usually, it's always inside that I go for my speech content. Thank you. Linda Marie, same question for you. What motivates you to speak and where do you acquire your content? What motivates me to speak is something that came to light for me or I realized was a profound truth in the world. And that is that the majority of the population in the world walks around feeling as if they don't matter, as if they are not enough. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO, it doesn't matter if you're a uh, a receptionist, it doesn't matter where you work, it doesn't matter what family you are or what age you are. People walk around feeling like they're not enough in the world. And I want to turn that around. I want people to get that they matter. It is, I think, my purpose on the planet. Where I get my material, I have been privileged to have 62 years of life filled with some of the most joyful and some of the most painful experiences of anybody that I know. I have had the most unbelievable successes and the most magnificent failures. I have a <clears throat> plethora of material to choose from and a lot of messages that I still want to give the world. So I just keep a list going. Sometimes I'll just be saying, oh, there's something I want the world to know. There's an idea. And then I seek about trying to deliver it in a way, and I profoundly believe this, you don't reach people through their heads. You only reach them through your, their hearts. So any material that I come up with, I always try to imbue it with something that's gonna land and touch people's hearts. Thank you. This is a question for all three of you. And we'll start with Linda Marie. When did you start competing? I started competing in Toastmasters speech contests in March of this year, I think was the, we had an area, it might've been, 
it might have been April, maybe the division was in April. Our, our, my speech club, our club figure of speech has never even had a contest within the club. We learned about it, we figured out how to do it, went on to area, but all along through this whole process, I've been kind of pulled along by people who knew what was going on around me. I had no idea how it worked. So I want that to be a message to every Toastmaster out there that if you have never been in a contest, look where I'm sitting. It can happen. All it takes is you finding your truth and speaking it in a profound way and speaking it vulnerably and from your heart. So just a quick follow-up, Linda Marie, is this your first competition? This is my very first competition for my very first contest that I've even seen. And I really want to give a call out to a year last December, I went to my very first TLI because I'm a new Toastmasters and I was an officer and you had to you, you know, go to the TLI and I went to one in Charlotte and Kevin Johnson spoke. I went to his session and he spoke about the Haymaker, a speech he did two years ago and he got to the uh, semifinal, he got to the finals. And I, I watched him and I said, hey, there's just a guy. He's just joined the contest and he did it. Maybe I'll think about it. And it was between seeing him and the time that they announced that there was the contest that I decided to join. So I've not ever, this is my very first contest ever for Toastmasters. We're glad you competed. Lindy, same question for you. When did you start competing? I joined in the fall of 2016 and I competed for the first time in 2017. I lost at the area level that year, but I got to go to my district conference and see that contest and I learned so much. That was when I realized the power of humor in a speech and how important humor is. There's not a written category for it on the judging sheet, but it makes all the difference. So that was just a big eye opener for me as someone for whom humor does not come naturally. And then in 2018, I made it to the semifinals. I was present there in the auditorium in Chicago when women took all first, second, and third place. I was one of the people screaming and crying and being so excited. Um, and then I took the ne next year off at, at doing a bunch of leadership things. And also it takes some rest sometimes after you've done this marathon or half marathon. And then uh, this year is my therefore third contest season. Congratulations. Mike, same question for you. How long have you been competing? Linda Marie is so much better than I am because it took me 25 years to get here. I, I started my first contest at Speakeasy Toastmasters in Tulsa 25, 20 something years ago, 25 years ago. Lost, lost at area then, then Tower Toastmasters. I made it to district that year, but then, then lost. I just, then I quit several times. I thought, no, I'm going to stop doing, <laughs> stop doing contests because this hurts. This feels bad to, to lose. And my ego would get involved and I'd have to tamp that down. And then I'd say, well, okay, I'll, I'll give this message. And it was fits and starts and various cities and two different states. So 25 years of, of all of that. And so I tip my hat to Linda Marie and Say, so if, you, if you've got a chance to do it more like her way, that's a better way. But, uh, but I learned a whole lot. I just kept losing until I didn't. Very good. Well, here's a question that came in specifically for Mike, but I think I'd like to hear from each of you on it. And we'll start with you, Mike, since it was directed towards you. How long did it take you to write your speech? The semifinal entitled Blue, which is one of my favorite speeches I've ever written. I was thinking about it, got back from a trip, and it just came, I sat down and it just came flooding. I sat down and typed the whole thing out in an hour, maybe 30 minutes. It just, it just downloaded. And, and I changed it a little bit, but it's still a lot that same speech. The one that, that one here for the final, it, it, it was pieces for maybe a few years. That's good. Thank you. L Linda Marie, same question. How long did it take you to write your speech? It, I started writing the speech a little over a month ago. 
And I test drove it at a club that had invited me to speak when they heard that I won at quarterfinals. I think it went on maybe 10 and a half minutes. And my feedback was great speech, but I want to trim it back a little bit. And I was doing so, I was including humor. I had a couple of humorous stories up front that had nothing to do with the real speech, thinking I needed to kind of roll into it slowly. And then I kept test driving, getting feedback, rewriting, test driving, getting feedback, rewriting. And the, <clears throat> and the Saturday before the semifinals, I had a group of very experienced people give me feedback. And they convinced me to, hey, if you're going to be about it, be about it. Get rid of all that other stuff. And I, it went through a total rewrite last Sunday. And so it's been over the course, a little over a month, the last month that I've been writing this speech. Thank you. Lindy, same question. How long did it take you to write your speech? I've already spoken about the fact that things don't necessarily, don't come out polished for me, certainly the first time. So one of the advantages of this year was that COVID stretched the contest season out, at least in my district, because district was supposed to happen in May and it ended up happening later. So there were actually more months for speech development. And it just takes time for me. It, it takes time. Not the first writing. I'm a writer. I can write. It's the revising. It's the, it's the uh, being willing to let go of my ideas and actually listen to people's feedback and take it in and apply it. And I just tell you, I can't wait to see Toastmasters all over the nation doing this and going like this. I'm just so excited about the innovations that Mike brought in. And I'm sure it's going to be everywhere, Mike. Just the biggest thing. And then uh, the, this final speech, I um, began about six weeks ago, I'd say. Thank you. Mike, question for you. What's the difference between writing for the sake of writing and writing for the sake of speaking? Ooh, that's really good. I'll have to think, I'll have to think out loud so I may, <laughs> may double back and, and contradict myself. But I think if, I think one of the things that really helped a lot a few years ago, I started as I, I, I went into a table topics contest and I, I tried writing, sitting down and writing for 15 minutes every day. And I read something by Stephen King some years ago that said he wrote uh, 5,000 crappy words every day. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write something, whether it sounds good, whether it's not, whether it's to writing 15 minutes every day. And I found that made a, a huge difference. But I would, I would write thinking, okay, what if this would become a blog post? What if this would become a... So, so I think to, directly to answer your question, I write first if it were as if it would become a blog post, what would be interesting? Or if it would be a book chapter, what would be interesting, a story? And then go back in the editing process and, and say, in speaking, there's gotta be, there's gotta be more humor. There's gotta be some physical, hopefully physical comedy, some, something that's visually interesting. So if I, rather than say, like in this speech, I originally said, in the final speech here, I said, when I went into the library, um, Mrs. Landon had, I noticed she had a coffee mug of very sharp pencils within arm's reach. That was very concerning. I thought, okay, is there something I can visually do there that makes that a more interesting piece? It breaks up the narrative. And so then I went in and in the writing, wrote that in in parentheses that I would do that. So I, I think that's the, that's the piece, thinking about the pa where the pauses land thinking about where visuals do, writing first as if it's going to be read, and then in the editing process, making it speech ready. Very good. Here's a question that came in for all three of you, and I don't know that it's mutually exclusive, but if you could choose only one, would you rather be a storyteller or a performer? And let's go with Mike to start. Storyteller. Well, that was your shortest answer so far, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Linda Marie. Uh, I'm going to say storyteller as well, but I'm going to tell you why. 
Whenever I speak or write, I start with this question. What do I want people, how do I want people to be different after they read something from me or they hear something from me? What do I want them to, how do I want them to be different in the world? How do I want them to be, feel different in their hearts? I don't think you get into people's hearts by performing on a stage. I think there can be some performative aspects of what you do to engage people, but I've seen so many speakers that get, that are more performers on stage and it doesn't touch people's hearts. So without question, I would rather be a storyteller. Good, Lindy, same question, storyteller or performer? I would argue that I don't find so much difference between those two words. For me, the power of being on stage has to do with the exchange between you and the audience. That as you deliver your message, they get something and then they give you something back. There's this wonderful, wonderful circle. And I would say that opera singers, Pavarotti, on and on, they move people to the core. So I disagree completely that performances don't affect their audiences. And I would be either one, joyfully. Very good. Here's a question that came in. That's a multi-part question, but I think it's a very good one. And I think a lot of us think about this. So let's start with uh, Lindy with this and it's multi-part. How much time did you spend practicing and did you memorize it or use points to move you onward? Hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. You know, it just keeps running through you. My, my favorite way to practice actually is to do something that's a physical task, like weeding is one of my favorite things. Go out there and weed and just do short sections and not necessarily in order. I do memorize. I am not very good at table topics yet, maybe in a few years. So words that are prepared come out of my mouth much more effectively than ones I have not prepared. Now I'm lost. What was the question of Cash Richard? Did you, did you memorize it or use points to move onward? Do I memorize it? Yes, I memorize it, but memorizing is not the end goal. It's internalizing, as Dar Darren LaCroix would say. It goes beyond memorizing to where it comes out because it's a part of me. So uh, both memorizing and, no, points, points make me stutter, so I can't just point to myself. Thank you. Linda Marie? How much time did you spend practicing and did you memorize it or use points to move you onward? I typed it all out completely. And then I would sit on my back porch with a yellow highlighter and I would read through it. I would read through it. And when I felt a section of it was completely embodied. And when Lindy says internalized, that's, a, that's what I'm um, thinking of embodied. Then I would highlight it. I would say, okay, that that's done. I don't need to look at that again. And then every night, as I lay in bed before I fell asleep with my timer, I would say it out loud, run through the speech, see if I missed anything. If I did, I'd get back up, reprint it out and highlight that section again to memorize. And until it was just completely in my bones. I told my husband, the semifinal speech and this speech, on my deathbed, you could give me the first line of both of these speeches. I guarantee you I can complete them to the end and within time. Very good. Mike, same question for you. How much time did you spend practicing and did you memorize it or use points to move you onward? I don't know how long, time, how long I spent practicing. I'm, I'm a big fan of consistent habits. So back when I was commuting to work, I would get in my car and the first thing I would do is I would run through the speech. And then when I got back in my car to drive home, first thing I would do is run through the speech. If I thought about different times, I had a pause during the day, I might run through it. And I try to run through it various ways, like I would give it as fast as I could, those different ways. When my commute changed from driving to the 10 paces from my bedroom to now what is my twin's former nursery, <laughs> I, I, the first thing I did in my day was run through the speech. I kept some sort of that same cadence. So I don't know how many hours, but I would, I would do that each, each day, morning and night at least. And then how I, I write it out, write it out first. And then I sat 
and I closed my eyes and I thought through the main points as I walked around my house. So each room in the, in the downstairs was a different point. And as I went around the dining room table, each chair was a visual of the points I wanted to make in, in that piece. And so then in the speech, I was looking at the camera and visually just walking around my house. Interesting technique, very interesting technique. Question for all three of you. What did you learn from the world, past world champion winners? Mike, we'll start with you. Well, Mark Brown spent a lot of time with me and I, I owe him such a, a debt of gratitude. And I would say the biggest, one of the biggest pieces I learned from Mark was physically embodying the words that I was saying. If you went back and watched my division speech, he pointed this out to me and it's, it's so true. I look like a reporter. I'm reporting the story and he pushed me to get out of that, out of that shell and feel the words that I was saying and embody the words that I was saying. That was a big one. The, in, in prior contests, a lot of, of course, from Darren LaCroix early about humor, 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 and what that looks like. I'm such, uh, so appreciative of, of that. Lance, talked about not putting up the fourth wall. And I vehemently disagreed with him <laughs> at the time, but I then started playing with it, especially in this medium. If I, I, know, I noticed that when I experimented with it, when I don't put up the fourth wall, like when this is Montgomery puts her arm around me and I'm not talking to me here, I'm talking to me here, it made it much more powerful. So I would say those, those three things from former world champions then, then affected this speech the most. Very good, Linda Marie, same question. What have you learned from the past world champions? Well, I watched, initially I went out, when I entered the contest, I went out and looked at YouTube videos and I just Googled world champions of public speaking and Toastmasters. And I watched a couple of them, totally intimidated, turned them off, said, this is, these people are really good. And then when I won another level, then I won at area, then I won at division, and then at district, I kept watching more of those, learning some of the nuances of being on stage and how they connected with being on stage. And then when the news came that it wouldn't be on stage and there wouldn't be a Paris, then I said, well, I have to just stop watching them. And I started getting feedback. Some, from some very knowledgeable people in Toastmasters, someone that has been a prior judge, someone who has been a finalist in the past, and just getting continual feedback from them. And I think that's, that was instrumental, is not trying to be all in my own little cocoon, but completely opened up in being open. To, and I would say, look, I don't need to know what I'm doing right, so let's just hone in on what's not working. And so I think that's what helped me. Very good. Lindy, same question. What did you learn from the past world champions? I remember sitting in the auditorium in 2018 watching Ramona Smith's winning speech. And the thing that struck me right between the eyes watching her was that thing they teach us when we do our icebreaker about opening, close, and three points. It really works. Look at that. I was like, whoa. <laughs> so just the elegance of simplicity, like Kwong's semifinal speech was just elegant, elegant that way. Uh, I've been a member of Stage Time University, Darren LaCroix Stage Time University this past year. I must confess to having been lurking, which means that I have not been, I've been looking at things, but not being very present. I can say that I've gotten a huge amount from watching Darren and Craig coach people, just getting an eye for what makes an opening effective and, and how to, this is one thing that I find really important and powerful to speak with more use and fewer eyes so that there's a balance between the IU ratio and uh, just on and on. I am so appreciative of those who've gone before me. I feel like when there are people who've succeeded so well, it gives you the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of giants because there's 
so much to learn from those who've already succeeded. Thank you. We're getting really close to the end here. I've only got a few more minutes. So in true tabletop fashion, before I close out, one minute or less from each of you, any advice for future contestants? Lindy, we'll start with you. Just do it. Don't be afraid. Open up your heart and speak that thing that needs speaking and know that somebody out there really needs to hear exactly what you have to say. And also, I want you to know that the thing about the contest is everybody watching really does want you to succeed. And after you've shared something that's important to you, they feel close to you. So you are building community every time you do that. And the speech contest, like nothing else in Toastmasters for me, has accelerated my growth as a speaker because you work on the same material over and over and over. If you do not want to compete, at least do that. Work on the same material over and over and over, and you will find yourself growing in leaps and bounds. And I can't wait to see you standing here. Thank you, Lindy. Linda Marie, same question for you, minute or less. What is the question? I'm sorry, I forgot. What advice would you give for future speakers and competitors? I'm going to, to just uh, mimic what Lindy said. Just do it. Speak your truth. Speak that thing that you're afraid people will find out about you. Speak your authentic, vulnerable truth. And when you do, you give other people permission to speak their truth. And it's only through that that we get to know each other and that we shed this skin called we're not worthy or we're not enough. And don't be afraid to fail. If you do, if you fall off the horse, get right back on and just give a big resounding giddy up and get on with it. Thank you. Mike Carr, world champion, minute or less. I would tell you what my first mentor, Don Reynolds, told me. It's ho-hum, why did you tell me that? For instance, so what? So starting out at the beginning, always think the audience is saying, ho-hum, they're not interested in me just because I'm standing here. So I've got to grab their attention. And then they say, why did you tell me that? And I make my point. They say, okay, for instance, give me examples. And then those examples, they are so much better if they're stories rather than declarative statements. Stories trump everything. Stories are king. And then, so what? So what's the, the point at the end of all of it? All of my best speeches have followed some iteration of that, of that path. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations again to each of our 2020 World Championship winners today. You have reached this goal after many months of hard work, practice and refinement of your speaking skills. You and your fellow speech contestants have accepted additional challenges this year and have shown exceptional adaptability and success. Enjoy this moment because you have earned it. Members and guests, thank you for attending this showcase. Enjoy the rest of your day.